Chapter 2. Prehistory and Classical Portugal. The Stone Age to the End of the Roman Era. Early Settlement. Portugal has a long history of human settlement. Early hominids lived there, and archaeological research over the last 30 years has provided fascinating evidence, even if the broader picture, as for other countries, can be elusive. Homo antecessor, the archaic Homo sapiens, were followed by Neanderthals and then by Cro-Magnon humans, the origins of modern Homo sapiens. There is evidence of the coexistence of Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon humans, and in 1999, just north of Lisbon, a Paleolithic skeleton with a legacy from both was discovered. Initially cave dwellers, the Cro-Magnon humans were able to range widely, using stone and composite tools, not least as weapons, and they developed skills accordingly. Cave drawings survive in the Grutesh dush Coral in the Alentejo from around 15,000 BCE and in the archaeological park of the Coa Valley. As in France and Spain, animals play an important role in these drawings. Early carvings can be seen in Oporto's Suarez dos Reis Museum. The Grutas das Lapas caves near Torres Novas were occupied in Neolithic times. The Ice Ages provided major issues of adaptation as the climate cooled. Portugal was not covered in the ice sheet that shrouded much of northern Europe. Nevertheless, it was affected by the major fall in temperature, by its savage effect on growing seasons, and by the falling of the sea level due to the freezing of water near the poles. The subsequent rise in the temperature after the Ice Ages ended in about 10,000 BCE saw far more benign environments for plants, and in part as a result, for animal life. Humans benefited, both as hunters and as gatherers, and the population rose. Larger mammals, however, could be badly affected by climate change, and were also hunted to extinction. Evidence of hunter-gatherers has been found from around Alcacer even earlier, indeed back to the Mesolithic period, about 40,000 years ago. The Sadu estuary was exploited, including in searching for shellfish, a practice also seen in Japanese coastal waters. In turn, cereal cultivation spread, with the domestication of wild crops and their propagation. There was also a domestication of animals that led to sheep and goat herding. As a consequence, the roaming and foraging lives of hunter-gatherers came to overlap and then be replaced by more sedentary lifestyles. Thanks to the more intensive agriculture, villages that were probably inhabited year-long were established, for example on hilltops in the lower Targus Valley in about 5000 BCE. Their setting provided protection. Such settlements saw the development of craft skills and trade, and had the manpower for building and for concerted activity. Stone monuments, including megaliths around Evora and more generally in the Alentejo, are an important legacy. Particularly impressive is the Cromelec dos Almendres, a far-flung oval of 95 granite monoliths ten miles west of Evora, surrounded by a cork oak forest and nearby the Menir dos Almendres and the Antegrande do Sampugero, Europe's largest dolmen, a single-chamber megalithic tomb. The remains from the last site are in Evora's museum. These megaliths indicate the sophistication of a society that used such sites for ritual practices and for astronomy. A considerable level of organisation is suggested by such works, there are also megalithic burial chambers in the region around Lisbon, although permanent settlements do not leave an archaeological trace until about 2500 BCE. The first known native people of Portugal date from the Late Bronze Age, 1100 to 700 BCE. Known as the Estrimnius, Latin Estrimni, they had fortified settlements in the valleys and on the estuaries of central Portugal. The archaeological record improves with the Iron Age, during which Celtic peoples, having crossed the Pyrenees, moved into Portugal in about 700 BCE.
Building fortified hill villages or citanias such as San Fins de Freve near Santo Tirso, a walled settlement with about a hundred huts. A key example is the Citania de Priterus between Braga and Guimarães, which was inhabited from about 300 BCE. Protected by walls and supported by a water distribution system, it contained over 150 stone huts linked by paved paths. The site, which includes reconstructed huts, can be visited, while remains can be seen in Guimarães in the archaeological museum named after Martin Sarmento who excavated the site, and also in his manor house. The former has Celtic sarcophagi and decorative stones from the Celt-Iberian bathhouses of the region. To the northwest, on the Mount of Santa Lucia near Viana do Castelo, the ruins of another Sitenia can be visited. Further south, Alcácer du Sal, on the river Sado, originated as an Iron Age hill fort, so also with Linares and Monsanto. The defensive character of such sites is readily apparent, not least in providing warnings of raiders. The sites served to protect people, their grain stores and their animals. So also with the defensive possibilities of Almurol, an island in the Tagus, where there was an Iron Age fort that was to be conquered and occupied by the Romans. Museums hold important material from the Iron Age, the regional archaeological museum in Shavish has bronze tools, grinding stones, which were crucial for milling grain, and jewellery. The museum of Don Diogo de Souza in Braga holds arrowheads, ceramics, and funerary objects. It is difficult to determine the relationship between the Celts and the pre-existing tribes. Alongside different cultural groups, there was probably much overlap not least due to intermarriage, but in both cases there are many difficulties involved in classification and in its application. Changes across time also entail questions about the causation of change. Phoenicians and Greeks The nature of the available archaeological and later written records direct attention to external links and foreign intervention in Portugal, while important, these links and intervention can, however, lead to a serious underplaying of indigenous developments. The Iron Age saw the establishment of a Phoenician presence, with a nearby Phoenician mercantile base at Gadir, or Cadith, from about 800 BCE. Precious metals, especially copper, iron, tin, gold and silver, were their goal, and were well worth the journey. Tin was important for the production of bronze. There were Phoenician colonies in Abul and Alcacer. Influence was not restricted to the coast. For example, the Rio Arad provided a river route into the Algarve, along which copper and iron could be transported for export. At Mertola on the river Guadiana, the Phoenicians had an inland trading position. Further north there was another at Alcacer do Sal, each were to be municipalities where the citizens had old Latin rites during the Roman Empire. In return for the precious metals, the Phoenicians brought Mediterranean goods, such as wine and textiles. Trade, moreover, became the means for technological and cultural transmission. In the 8th century BCE, the Phoenicians established a position in Lisbon which they called Alice Ubo, or Calm Harbour. The site was on the southern slope of the castle hill. There may also have been a Greek trading station there, and the Greeks appear to have established a presence in Portugal in the 6th century BCE. Their trade was similar to that of the Phoenicians. Indeed, the Latin name for Lisbon, Olisipo, was said in late antique and Phoenician tradition to derive from the fact that Ulysses went there in his wanderings. Phoenician influences came to be directed by Carthage, a dynamic Phoenician settlement near modern Tunis. It became a major power and established a significant presence in southern and eastern Spain, but not in distant Portugal, although the latter was probably within the ambit of Carthaginian commercial influence. Carthaginian attempts at conquest were allegedly unsuccessful. Roman Conquest 
Having conquered the Carthaginian bases and territories in Spain during the Second Punic War, 218 to 201 BCE, Carthage's nemesis, Rome, eventually sought to extend its power across the entire peninsula. From the Guadalquivir Valley in nearby Andalusia from 208 BCE, the Romans began to press on nearby southern Portugal. Yet the Romans found that there was a major difference between overthrowing another foreign imperial presence in the shape of Carthage and subjugating the rest of Iberia. The former was more vulnerable to attack and more focused on cities, notably ports, that could be besieged. The targets in the remainder of Iberia were far more diffuse. This helps explain the length of time it took for the Romans to conquer Portugal, but there were more significant issues, notably the culture of conquest and, separately, alternative commitments. The republican system, with its annual consulates and praetorships, functioned to give the office holders brief opportunities for military glory, ideally winning triumphs as well as the profits to be made from war, including slaves. So it was in the interests of the ruling elite in Rome to win victories and take loot, but at the same time keep the war going almost indefinitely. The same situation occurred later in the early Islamic period. The Umayyads could in practice have eliminated the small Christian states in the north in the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries, but needed them as targets for annual campaigning to advertise their credentials as Islamic rulers. Returning to the long time the Roman conquest took, Rome, having defeated Carthage, was drawn into a series of wars with Macedon, that left it in control of Greece, but that had absorbed much of Rome's energy through to 148 BCE. There were also other major struggles, including war further east with the Seleucid king Antiochus in 192 to 189 BCE, as well as the Third Punic War with Carthage, 149 to 146 BCE. Nevertheless, Rome made gains in this period in Iberia, and these gains were followed in 139 to 133 BCE by the successful conquest of much of Iberia. The Lusitani, a tribal confederation, probably Celtic, between the Targus and the Duru, had provided firm resistance from 194 BCE, notably in 147 to 139 BCE under Viriathus, but his death was followed by Roman conquest. The Roman account was that Viriathus was killed in his sleep by his companions, who had been bribed by the Romans, only for them to receive execution as their reward, on the grounds that Rome did not pay traitors. The Roman conquest involved local support, a practice also seen elsewhere. The city of Olisipo, Lisbon, provided help against the Lusitani from 138 BCE, and the Romans fortified the settlement. In 137 BCE, Roman forces moving north crossed the Douro, and the following year reached the river Minho. The Roman troops proved reluctant to cross the rivers, fearing that they were the Lethe, the river of forgetfulness. Julius Caesar, governor of Hispania Alteria, and after whom Beja was named Pax Iulia, campaigned in what is now modern Portugal, north of the Tagus, conquering local tribes in 61 to 60 BCE. Aside from conquering, the Romans also faced rebellions, both from the indigenous population and, as elsewhere in the empire, from Roman rebels. With reference to Caesar's campaigns against Pompey's sons in Iberia in 45 BCE, a Roman writer noted... In view of the constant sallies of the natives, all places which are remote from towns are firmly held by towers and fortifications. They have watchtowers in them. Resistance to Roman conquest continued in northwest Spain and northern Portugal until 17 BCE, and this impressed Roman commentators, as well as providing a way to praise their own successes. In the 19th century, this resistance attracted interest from nationalist commentators and artists engaged with the idea of an exemplary pre-Roman national origin, 
and concerned to trace difference from Spain to pre-Roman tribes. However, there was a marked preference instead for claiming a Roman legacy and for focusing not on the resistance to the Romans, but instead on the eventually successful medieval resistance to the Muslims. The latter resistance could be presented as having an exemplary Christian character. Alongside the strength of the resistance came the many challenges to the Roman troops posed by the environment, notably those of operating in the mountains, of the climate, and of logistical support. Roman rule By the time the conquest of Iberia was complete, most of what would become Portugal was already part of the Roman system. Iberia was significant as a source of food and minerals, for example of gold from near Oporto. Establishing large agricultural estates, latifundios, the Romans developed viticulture and the cultivation of grain and olives. Wool and horses were other significant exports to Italy as well as elsewhere in the empire. Such estates were presumably linked to villas, a good example of which is the 1st century CE Villa Cardillo, near Torres Noves. The baths survive, as do mosaics. Roads were built by the Romans, originally in order to exert power and authority, notably to move troops for conquest and counter-insurgency. Near Porto de Moche there is a Roman road that has become a walking trail. The roads constituted a system. Road junctions, such as Bracara Augusta, Braga, became significant settlements, which in turn were crucial to the economy, and in particular to the movement of goods. From Braga, roads ran to Olisipo, the sole municipality of Roman citizens in modern Lisbon in Pliny's time, and to Astorga in Spain. The associated bridges, which were important to the system, could be impressive. The Roman bridge at Ponte de Lima, en route from Braga to Astorga, mostly dates from the 14th century, but a segment of the Roman original survives. Finished in 104 CE, the 140-metre-long Roman bridge at Chavish survives with its arches and two milestones. Not being on the Mediterranean, Roman Portugal was less well integrated into the empire than much of Spain. Lusitania, the province covering much of what would become Portugal and Western Castile, had its capital at Emerita Augusta, Merida in modern Spain, and the scale of the theatre, amphitheatre and temple of Diana there in part reflect the tax revenues raised in Portugal. Yet, thanks to the ports, for example, modern Oporto, Lisbon, Alcácer and Alvor, goods could be exported directly from Portugal, such as salt from Vila do Conde. Moreover, there were also significant Roman building works in Portugal, notably at Conimbriga near Coimbra. Originally a Celtic settlement, this became a city on the route from Lisbon to Braga. Tourists can visit the remains of baths and luxurious villas, which have attractive mosaic floors, notably the extensive Casa des Fontes, House of Fountains. In Lisbon, where the population under the Romans may have been around 30,000, recent building work in the BCP bank has revealed the remains of a Roman fish-preserving plant, which can be seen in the Nucleo Archeologico. Fish sauce, garum, was important to Roman cuisine and helped bring wealth to the city. Fish salting was also carried out in Setobriga, a town near Troia, where the stone tanks can be visited. Also in Lisbon are the remains of a Roman theatre dating from 57 CE and an accompanying museum which provides relevant information. Most of Roman Lisbon, however, has been destroyed and built over to a degree that there is nothing left. Buildings focused on the cities, the forcing houses of Romanization, the centres of government and of Roman religious cults, and the locations to which the wealth generated in the countryside was transferred, notably through taxes, rent and expenditure. Landowners tended to live in the cities, where Roman dress and the Latin language were adopted. Thus, Conimbriga had a forum and a bathing complex, while in Evora it is possible to visit the remains of the Roman baths, only discovered from 1987, 
as well as of a temple generally referred to as a temple of Diana. In Braga there are numerous remains, including the ruins of a theatre and baths that date from the 2nd century CE, as well as the 1st century Fountain of the Idol, which was associated with a water cult dedicated to a local Lusitanian god, Tongo Embiagas. The Casa do Infanta in Oporto has Roman foundations and mosaics on show. Most modern cities trace their origins to the Roman period or to the Roman development of Celtic sites. Thus, Leria was the Roman Colipo, while Faru was Osonoba, and its archaeological museum contains a very impressive Roman mosaic. Many, such as Santarain, Roman Scalabis, were the administrative capitals of a region. However, some Roman cities did not have this legacy. Egitania is the site today of only a small village, Idenia Eveia, although the cathedral holds a large collection of Roman epigraphs. Roman remains can also be found in the shape of country villas, such as that at Pizoege, near Beja, where the mosaics and baths can be visited. As elsewhere in the empire, Romanization was much weaker in areas that were mountainous and or remote from cities, and where the economy was more a matter of subsistence and or pastoral agriculture. That description covered most of Portugal. Moreover, this distinction remained pertinent across Portugal's history. There are, however, remains in these areas. For example, the Kentum Kellas, a Roman tower, survives in Beira Baixa, although its function is unclear. Portugal was affected by the more general developments of the Roman Empire, ranging from politics to the spread of disease. Knowledge about Portugal spread, thus it is covered in the Geographica of the Greek geographer Strabo, about 63 BCE to 24 CE, who was born in modern-day Turkey and wrote about the known world. Strabo referred to the wealth of Iberia as having attracted conquerors, and to Iberia as temperate, thanks to its oceanic climate. He noted the production of copper, gold, salt and cloth, the poverty of much of the soil, and that northern Iberia was cold and rugged. Pliny, in his Natural History, wrote that from the Pyrenees to the Douro, the entire region was full of mines of gold, silver, iron, lead and tin, he reported that gold was found in the river Tagus in the form of auriferous sands, and that Lisbon was famous for its mares, which conceive from the west wind. Pomponius Mela, who was writing in about 43 to 44 CE, and came from near Gibraltar, referred to gems in the Tagus. Developments subsequently included the diffusion of new religions, such as Mithras, Judaism, an old religion, spread as a consequence of the Jewish diaspora that followed the suppression of the revolt in Palestine in 132 CE. Judaism was also diffused in the new and very different form of Christianity, which was able to spread without ethnic limits. In 312, Christianity became the official religion of the empire. It was rapidly established and left a major imprint in the cities of the later empire, where churches were built. Alcasa, Salatia, had a bishop in about 300, and Braga certainly had a bishop in around 390. The Nucleo Archeologico in Lisbon includes the remains of a 5th century Christian burial place. Although born in Rome, Pope Damasus I ruled 366-384, had parents who originated in Lusitania, possibly in Equitania. The cities of what became Portugal were heavily fortified in response to attacks from barbarians, which became serious in the 260s. In Conimbriga, a large wall was erected through the town centre. There was also political, fiscal and economic instability within the empire itself, and Portugal briefly became part of a rebel Roman Empire based in Gaul, France, under Posthumus. Aurelian, ruled 270-275, to 275, reunited the Roman Empire, however, and brought a measure of revival. To strengthen the administration, 
Diocletian, ruled 284 to 305, redrew provincial boundaries and introduced a system of joint rule that saw Iberia linked with Italy and North Africa. This, however, did not provide lasting stability and instead looked towards the lasting division of the eastern and western empires in 395. Iberia was part of the more vulnerable and less well-resourced west and was invaded in 409 by Germanic tribes, the barbarians that had emerged in Scandinavia during the Nordic Bronze Age of 1700 to 500 BCE, before moving south, eventually forming migrating tribal entities. Roman influence in Portugal continued, but it had been fatally weakened, and as with England, political and military links with Rome were sundered in the 410s. Lisbon was ravaged by the Visigoths in 419, and was captured by the Suevi in 469. They had destroyed once impressive Conimbriga the previous year. The Legacy of Rome Although this legacy was much shadowed by barbarian conquest and its later consequences, Roman rule left Latinity, Christianity, an urban structure and an experience of unity, as well as remains that are not only still impressive, but also helped define the imagination of Rome's successors. Archaeology has helped expand our knowledge of Roman Portugal, and has provided more sites for tourists, as well as more material to consider in museums. There is still more to excavate, including at Conimbria. Although the legacy of Roman rule was significant, it was and is far less present than in Italy, or indeed Spain. Instead, like Britain, what became Portugal absorbed the Roman legacy, and used it to justify its colonial rule, but rather shrugged off the administrative legacy of Roman rule, focusing instead on the long centuries of state formation in the medieval period. In the case of Portugal, this process was accentuated because it was only then, and indeed over 700 years after Roman rule ceased, that Portugal became a separate state. In contrast, the Roman period was very much one of subordination within an Iberia in which Spain was clearly dominant. Moreover, Roman Portugal did not produce emperors, as Spain did with Trajan and Hadrian. Later Portuguese writers did not devote much attention to the period of Roman rule or to the enduring legacy of Rome. So also with other aspects of Portuguese culture and today with representations of Portuguese history. Even Christianity, a key development of the Roman period, was removed from that mooring. In large part, this was because the emphasis instead was on Portuguese Christianity as the product of the driving back of the Moors. Thus, the post-Roman period of Suevi and Visigoth rule was also underplayed. Another approach would be to argue that the origins of Portugal really are 12th century and were centrally focused on this driving back of the Moors. Other countries have looked back to distant origins, most prominently Greece, and have underplayed, in contrast, the shorter process that deserves attention. This has not been the Portuguese course. Indeed, the theme of Roman rule was not really welcome, because it focused attention not only on foreign control, but also on the issue of Spanish rule, or rule as part of a Spanish-dominated Iberia, as, under the Romans, that was the pattern of administration on the peninsula. <laughs>